Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so for those of you, uh, just to make sure, this is, uh, this is track B. This room is track B. Track A is in the Silverman room. And uh, so we had a great conversation about the transformation going on, the digital transformation going on in the industry. Eric, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Whitman from panel number one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, now we're, we're um, this, this track is actually called the next wave. So we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about a number of things related to this future, uh, the digital future in particular. And so the next session, uh, I'm delighted to have uh, my colleague Andrea Chigou uh, uh, join us with a terrific panel that we'll be discussing. Uh, the premise here is that if data is the new oil, uh, it needs to be refined. So we're gonna talk about that. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Andrea and our esteemed panel, uh, including Michael Mandel from Comstack, the co-founder and CEO of Comstack, uh, Guy Zippori, the co-founder and CEO of Skyline AI, and L.D. Salmonson, the co-founder of Cherry. So there you go. Thank you. Okay. Are we, which seats are we using here? Doesn't matter. There. Oh. <laughs> 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 First data question, four, four people, five seats, how do you choose? How do you do that? Okay. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on this stage today. Um, I am in awe of the three of you, and I've been lucky enough to get to know you over the past few years um, and get to know some of your data, and it's been such a joy um, as a data scientist and somebody working um, in, in the field to teach and educate students about what data science and machine learning for real estate could be, um, but also for engaging in research where we fundamentally ask uh, econometric and machine learning based questions to see what we could do uh, with transforming analytics in real estate. Um, and so in the lab, we're very excited to be able to work and, and utilize some of these data sources. But so I wanted to bring these, these gentlemen on stage so that they could share um, their thoughts and perspectives on where, where our field is. Um, where it's going, um, and talk a little bit about what's, what's a little bit at the frontier um, overall. But before we get started, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear from the three of you. So Michael, tell me about Comstack. Tell me about its development and, and where you guys are uh, today. Sure, so we're a real estate tech company. We're a data company. We've been around for about seven years. And uh, what we're known for is that we crowdsource commercial real estate data. Uh, so we have a network of about 20,000 commercial real estate brokers, appraisers, and research people at real estate brokerage firms who actually share data on Comstack. Uh, they earn credits for sharing that data, which is like a virtual currency, and they can use those credits to get other data back out. Uh, the reason why we do it this way and we gamify it and we'll, it, so that people will share data is, is it allows us to g capture information that no one else has um, because we've incentivized people to share it. And so we capture information like lease comp data, so the, the specific details of lease transactions and all the, all the information within them, uh, sales comps, property level data, and then have an, an analytics layer that sits on top of um, that, that data platform. And then we sell subscription access to that data to some of the world's largest commercial real estate investors and lenders, private equity firms, banks, asset managers, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, and um, a bunch of universities, including MIT. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, you said one thing. You, you want to gamify it. You want to make it fun to get something that nobody wants to give you. So just, just to reflect on that, why doesn't anybody want to give you information? Well, it's, it's, it's more that like, you know, the kind of information that we're gathering is very, very valuable, right? Um, key detailed transaction information around, you know, like in the case of a sales comp, the net operating income and the cap rate. In the case of a lease comp, the rent bumps over time, the TI, the, the tenant improvement allowance, the free rent, all the detailed nuances of these deals. And this is information that is not in the public record at all. And so it, it's captured in the hearts and minds of people who've worked on these deals and have information you know, from the deals they've worked on. And it's just frankly, there's no incentive for them to share it with other people unless they're getting something in return. Yeah. And, and my background was that I was a commercial real estate broker. I traded comps with other brokers all the time. <laughs> and that's the way that I was used to getting data. And that's the way that we exchange data. And the thought was, 
well, I know that this works offline. There's nothing online. There's no resource where you can find all this data when you need it. So let's just take the offline process and move it online. So the gamification wasn't necessarily to make it fun, but more to just incentivize people to actually want to share so they're getting something in return, which will cause them to share that data. Yeah, systematize that. Guy, what, what's your experience? What, how have you been developed? And, and tell us more about your background. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm coming from technology background. I'm a tech entrepreneur. Um, we are a group of four partners working together for many years. We worked in different industries. All our previous startups were around data, um, AI. Today, today I hate uh, using this word, but uh, <laughs> uh, and it, in Scala, uh, Scala AI is um, an AI investment manager for commercial real estate. Um, we started with multifamily asset class. We started by building our own data set. Today, we're connected to more than 200 different data sources, public and private, structured, unstructured. We're trying to put our hands on every piece of information that may affect real estate values. Um, we started multifamily, we're looking at 400,000 different properties, which is almost all the multifamily assets in the US that has more than 50 units. And for each asset, we have about 10,000 different data points going back in time, up to 50 years, depending on the data source and the property. Uh, so we've built what is probably one of the largest data sets that exist in real estate, and then we use our AI teams to create multiple predictive models, trying to predict asset values, rent, occupancy levels, trying to understand markets, submarkets, and eventually using this together with our partners um, to form investment vehicles that are utilizing this technology to go after uh, real estate transactions. Okay, so just to clarify, you actually are a B2B business, whereas, Michael, you're a B2C business. Well, I see myself as a C, but, <laughs> <laughs> but more or less, you're, you're, you're serving an investor community and you're serving the entire real estate community. Well, we, we have both, right? So we have our exchange platform, which is, I guess, sort of B2C, but it's still commercial real estate professionals. And then the other enter our enterprise platform where we sell subscription access to the data, which is, which is you know, large corporates. Yeah. And so when you say AI, can you give us just a little bit of color by what you mean by that? Because it is such a buzzword right now. And I like, I like to actually make it so that all of us can start to be fluid in that language. Um, as an educator, I want, to, I want to take these words off their pedestal because I want everyone to start to say, yes, I want to employ analytic techniques like this to do that job. So, um, yeah. Or my partner is saying that we did AI much before it was cool. So, um, and in our internal conversation, we usually don't use this word at all. I think eventually um, people speak, I mean, people who mention AI, in, a lot of times are speaking about AI. It's, it sounds like, like a goal. Um, and it's important <laughs> to understand that AI, it's not the goal, of course, uh, but it's, a, it's another tool um, to to solve problems that we're dealing with. Um, so in our case, we use, uh, we have different predictive models. For example, we try, and we'll probably touch that later, um, uh, one of our models is trying to predict asset values. Um, and we have <coughs> models that are trying to predict rent and occupancy. So within that, we use different machine learning algorithms, which is a subset of uh, AI. Yeah. Um, but eventually, I think the main thing is that, um, is that instead of coding a rule-based algorithm, um, you use data and examples to train the system. So eventually there are um, pros and cons to using machine learning, and, uh, but, um, but eventually um, we are using this, in our case, to find, to locate um, um, markets and sub-markets. So we use this to, to understand where the rents are going or thing like that. Fantastic. Um, LG, tell us about Cherry and yeah, what sure. you've been building for a long time now. It doesn't feel that long. Um, so similar to Guy, um, we're, we're a repeat founding team and we sold a previous company to Oppenheimer and I used to spend a lot of time here in Boston, but also our previous companies were all in the data space. Um, in different industries, we're trying to solve the same problem. How do we connect a lot of data in real time to be able to make something, something meaningful from that data? That's what we do at Cherry. We're a data fusion platform. And our job is to connect large amounts of data in real time for large investors, banks, insurance companies. A lot of you are in the room today, obviously. And you know kind of the challenges that we have to deal with behind the scenes. And maybe to follow up on that, machine learning for us is really a tool, right? Um, to connect hundreds of thousands of data sets. So we cover 177 million properties, more than 200 billion data points. And 
doing that kind of stitch work manually is just impossible. We could spend a lifetime doing it and still do a pretty terrible job at it. And our job is to train models to do that on their own and try and connect those data sets, identifying what these fields are, even if the bank can't tell you, but they've been copying it over since the 70s, and they can't tell you what that means any more than you can, right? And be able to train models to identify that unknown and stitch that. And that's essentially what we do. So our job is to help those companies consume that downstream data connected. And maybe the, the analogy we were talking about earlier, I mean, yes, I think that that's a very apt analogy that data is the new oil, and, and data maybe in itself doesn't really mean anything, except maybe if you have proprietary data that nobody else has access to, obviously that's very valuable. But the challenge is, the data, you know, if we take that analogy further, isn't sitting in an unrefined area. It's sitting in tar sands. And you have to collect that and distill that from within those tar sands and put it into crude, and then refine it into one of the different formats, right? Light, sweet, right? All these different types of, of oil forms that will then be needed for these kind of petrochemical activities that do really cool stuff with that data. And I think that we all have that same challenge. How do we get that data into a state where we can actually do something meaningful with it instead of spending 95% of time on cleaning data instead of the actual data? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, we were just offline and we were talking about my students who had this data science machine learning class and they were like, wait, you said that data science would be sexy and what you actually ended up, ended up teaching me was cleaning and housework. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is very sexy, but, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, what we're dealing with is the reality of individual stories at an, at an observation level. So every one of these little data bytes is a story that's, that we're trying to refine and make sense out of. And, um, and so we were talking offline about how dirty is this data? How dirty is the process of getting all of this in line and and for the audience who's wanting to sort of engage in some of these strategies, um, how how much work have you been doing to 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 deal with that dirty data, Michael? Yeah, well, uh, that's kind of like as a company, you know, outwardly our, our specialty is in crowdsourcing data, but inwardly, sort of our our biggest competitive advantage is is it comes around the ability to work with really really dirty data because so we bring in. 50,000 comps a month, lease or sales comps from our members. And they, the people who submit this data to us are giving us these documents. We get Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PDFs, scanned PDFs. We had people, we've had people you know, fax us comps. We've had people mail us comps. We've had people who send them in the body of an email. And it, I mean, this data is disgusting. I mean, it's like it's a complete and utter mess. And so we've had to build an expertise around taking all of this data and normalizing it and cleaning it. And you know, some of it is analyst intervention. Some of it is people we've hired overseas to manually, like, you know, enter this data into like a basically an in-house mechanical Turk system that we built. But you know, also we use you know fancier things like you know optical character recognition, which has been around forever, and then layering on natural language processing to, to find the correct terms and information within the documents and get it into you know, a database where we can make sense of it. So yeah, we, we get very, very dirty data, and, and there's a lot of um, you know, different ways to clean it up. And some of it is just really simple stuff. So like, I'll give one example that we, we use, which is um, we have a, a tool that we built to normalize tenant names. And it uses machine learning to identify tenants that may be similar, but isn't, isn't sure. And then our analyst can choose which one is the actual correct one we want to show for that tenant name. And it counted and it found, you know, automatically, which is great, like 25 different versions of 711. The number 7 dash 11 spelled out. 7 dash 11, the number 11, <laughs> you know, 7, you know, with a hyphen, without a hyphen. I mean, it's like, Anyway, it's some of the, the most mundane, to your point, some of the most mundane stuff ends up being complex and a real challenge, but you have to do it. It's a real complex challenge, but it ultimately leads to, if we don't resolve these issues, if we don't work really, really hard at it, then we actually lead to potentially spurious results in our analytics. Exactly. And then that leads to like distrust of data science and machine learning overall and its progress. And so... Um, we'll be sitting in investment committee, and then all of a sudden, if it come ba comes back that something came came from really dirty data still, then everybody still shuts down with moving towards analytics away from their gut, right? Because this is a gut-based industry. Yeah. Um, well, actually, not just real estate. All industries are gut-based industries. <laughs> um, I have been, I've been hanging out with a lot of different <laughs> different professionals across the sectors, um, and that's, that's definitely true. So dirty data, yes, indeed. But does this lead to new data? Because I look to you guys, I, I know you've, you've produced a lot of new data yourself, but you, 
But in terms of what you two have been dealing with, I feel like sometimes all of the dirty data that you've been dealing with sometimes leads to something new. Any insights there in terms of how this process can lead us to something we didn't know about before? So <clears throat> I think maybe to add one more thing about the dirty data, and of course I, I agree and it's a dirty work. Um, and if, eventually they're saying that the predictions can only be as good as the data. So it's very important to have the data cleaned as, as you mentioned, uh, but it's also important to understand, again, going back to the roots, why do we have the data? What are we trying to get out of the data and how accurate Great. Uh, we need to be? In some cases, um, I mean, setting your, your goals of accuracy, understanding, uh, for example, um, uh, let's take, again, the value prediction model. So if you, if you use this just for ballparking when you try to deal source, maybe a certain percentage of, uh, of error, it's, it's okay. Um, because later you have people uh, looking at this, and if you have a po false positive or false negative, that's fine. Um, but if you're doing something that no one does today, I think, uh, like if you do algo real estate, like buying an asset based on the, uh, on the prediction, then that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, so it's also important to um, distinguish, I think. Um, <clears throat> and um, when you look at data and you start to playing with the data, back to your question, um, you also learn, I mean, pretty quickly you know how dirty the data is and how complex it will be to clean it. Uh, so one of the things that we found out, that we find is that when we go to uh, unconventional data sources um, that are more accurate, sometimes we find interesting insights in data sources that usually people don't look at. Like we look at trees in the neighborhood and using, uh, and today it sounds, might sound crazy, but uh, it's pretty easy to, to find this kind, of, uh, this kind of data and it's pretty accurate. So trying to look at how trees impact uh, real estate or uh, roads and things like that where the, the data is more accurate sometimes leads you to interesting um, outcomes. Yeah, definitely. LD, you have a lot of experience with alternative data sources, in my opinion. So tell me a little bit. I like the alternative. <laughs> the alternative until it's no longer alternative, right? <laughs> We're in this unique but terrible situation to be in is that we, don't, we can't afford ourselves the luxury of, of not striving for perfection because we don't get measured by some kind of end downstream product. We get measured by the data being connected. And we track just over 300,000 data sets that we have to connect for our clients. And they all expect perfection, right? You can't just say, well, we have some false positive negatives, which we do, clearly, obviously. Our, our models are never perfect. Um, and we have to adapt that for whatever that specific client need is. And we, we have the exact same problems that we discussed earlier, dealing with a lot of data and trying to connect it. We also have clients' internal data. Clients' internal data can literally take any form that you can imagine, any data structure that you can imagine. And having to connect that becomes really, really difficult. And we're in a world where standards um, are, are really non-existent. Maybe on the residential side, we have a little better situation with the Rezo standards, but um, on the commercial side, it's been really challenging. Oscar really hasn't delivered the promise that we want. We're, we're hopeful that they will, and they have pretty good leadership It's trying, but um, we miss those kind of standards, and that means that folks like us have to kind of pick up the slack. And really hopeful that they, do, that they succeed? I am. Um, I don't think that's something that would bother me in any way, right? At the end of the day, we still have to deliver end to end. The fact that people have a namespace that, that they agree on doesn't negate the challenge of trying to connect data on the back end, right? It's not this, okay, we put an ID onto a property and all I have to do is connect these IDs. If it was that simple, this would have been solved years ago, right? The challenge is there's different data types and what these things mean to people are very, very different within their core. Do I want to connect data to the lot level, to the building level, to the unit level, to the person, to the corporation, right? And different companies will want to do things differently because they have different use cases downstream. And so I, I very much would like to see both the unified namespace, at least to start with that, but then ideally also a data model. It would make my life a lot easier and wouldn't replace me along the way. So I really do encourage that. I find that fascinating. So you want you are taking on a cooperative strategy. I feel like actually you all pretty cooperative in the field. You really want to, to lead the sector into a, a more 
data open environment and particularly also a machine learning open environment, AI or not, let's just call it machine learning right. environment. Um, but you're also leading in this in your practices. So you all engage in some sort of automated strategy. So you spoke a little bit to it, Michael, with what you have to do to, to get the structured and unstructured world to play. Yeah. Um, but I, I think uh, LD, you and, um, you and Guy have to deal a lot with automated, mm, not only wrangling, but automated valuation to some degree. So actually, Guy, can you talk a little bit about what does this mean, automated valuation? And I think, Michael, you're also working in this. So I'd love to hear everybody's sort of perspective sure. as we move out of like, so I've got the data cleaned. Everything is sort of working for me. I feel good. It's tidy. We call it tidy. It's nice, tidy data. And now we're moving it out into an analytic space. And I want to start to predict. I want to start to see... I want to predict or I want to explain. I mean, I'm an econometrician, so I love to explain all day. Um, but but what, are you guys, what are you guys thinking about where we're at in being able to do this as an industry? Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I think, again, let's come back to, uh, to the goals and what we're trying to achieve by um, the uh, valuation models. And different usage requires different um, um, view into that problem. Um, so, and when we try to do, when we try to evaluate the, uh, an asset price, we look at, it, at that in different ways. So first, we're trying to look at how the um, investment community will look at the asset value. Um, and then we're trying to see how much we think the asset worth. Um, because we're trying to look for arbitrage opportunities. So usually we'll look at, value, at the value in different, from different angles and then try to compare between the different values that, that, we, uh, that we've been able to, to extract. So I think, uh, the, um, and a few examples to that, I think the, uh, the appraisers community need to look at valuation model differently than the investment community. Um, and um, when you use the value um, for, again, for filtering investment opportunities, trying to let's say I'm trying to look today for an asset that's worth between 50 to $100 million, then I need a certain, um, a certain level of, um, of accuracy. Um, but I think we see more and more different uh, AVMs um, that, that are using different approaches. Uh, there are the uh, machine learning based uh, algorithms, but then there's also the, um, when the data is more available, you can actually use the standard models like DCF and others, and then maybe you want to compare between them again, depend on your uh, needs. Um, yeah, it's moving, but I think um, Michael, you were you were saying that for you guys, you're definitely exploring AVMs or the world of AVMs um, increasingly. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, we're taking a little bit of a different approach at it. <clears throat> because if you look at most AVMs that have been out there, so AVMs have actually been around for a long time in residential real estate. And, you know, um, effectively they are looking at a comparable sale approach, right? So they're, they're the, the, the several players who are out there doing residential AVMs are pulling in public record data combined with MLS data and, you know, okay, this house sold for this much, it's got this many bedrooms, this, number, this many bathrooms, and it's next to this house, so it's, this house would sell for X because the other one that was like, you know, that works great in Levittown, Pennsylvania, and works relatively well for single family homes. Um, but of course, when you're valuing commercial real estate, you know, you, there's three means of valuation, which probably mo most of you being a real estate audience know about. You know, there's, the, there's obviously the, the comparable sale approach, there's the income approach, and there's the replacement cost approach. And you know, very valuable commercial real estate assets are, just, are, are entirely valued based off of the income approach. Those other models are there, but nobody cares about them for valuing a, you know, a million square foot building in a major city, you know, for instance. It's just, it's, it's the income approach or nothing else. And nobody's figured out an AVM for the income approach. And um, that's where we're really interested because we've got all this income data. We've got all the leases for these buildings. And so theoretically, if you know every lease of the building, you know, if you've got the sales comp data, so you know what the market cap rates are, and you um, can arrive at the OPEX data, which tends to be fall within a, a pretty tight range. It's pretty simple, NOI. You know, divided by cap rate equals price. Um, but it's simple, but you have to have the data. It all comes down to the data at the end of the day in order to do it right. 
And then the other thing you know, I, I, that, I'm, that I'm conscious of as it relates to AVMs is that in the residential space, AVM, AVMs have become completely a commodity. The price of an AVM is cents, literally cents, to, to get a valuation of a building. And, and banks are you know, calling these via API, doing a, you know, a million houses at a time. Um, if you want to have an AVM that is not a commodity, either the quality of your calculation has to blow away everybody else, but eventually other people can maybe figure it out. Or you've got to have proprietary data behind it that no one else has um, to be able to have something that's really defensible. Yeah. I mean, so now we're getting, we're getting into sort of the nuts and bolts of valuation, which is really, really fun. Um, because there's these different sort of approaches to engaging in this strategy of how am I going to price a building. Um, and again, theoretically, if I had every single lease in the building and I have its, its cap rate, I can get to a, a nice yield. Um, and, but then there's sort of this idea floating around, if we got more data, we could start to also understand these other arbitrage sort of factors, which would theoretically be embedded in the income. Well, right, you need, to, you need to really have the first fundamental data really, really down in order to take advantage of the arbitrage. Because what we've seen with a lot of people who bring in lots and lots of data sets is they try to bring in all these data sets to compensate for the fact that they don't have the most important data sets. Yes. It's like, you know, you know, and no offense to the trees comment, the trees are interesting, except the trees and the safety and the economic conditions and the retail and all that other crap is all built into the rent. So if you've got the rent, you know, the rent, the rent includes all of those factors because people pay more rent for things that have all those amenities. Now, once you've, if you have the rent data and then you bring in the tree data, then you can figure out the arbitrage because maybe you figure out that a building that has, you know, has lower rents than, some, than another building, but it has more trees, so it should have higher rents. <laughs> You know, and therefore it should be worth more. Yeah, I mean, you need both. So if we don't have this this core data of value, if I don't understand, you know, the variable of interest, what am I explaining here? I'm explaining the prices or or the rents or you know or the the capital mortgage rates. What is it that the variable of interest is? If I don't have that very clean and complete then I'm going nowhere. But in terms of deconstructing that and, and developing an arbitrage sort of strategy, then I need these other features because that's yeah. theoretically what people are doing. I mean, you have 300,000 data sets. That number always strikes me. It's just getting bigger. It was 270 just a few months ago. Um, How did you add 30,000 data sets in a few months? I didn't do anything to do that. Other people really smart <laughs> my team did, and I get to take credit for all their hard work. Um, I don't even think they're doing it. It's mostly models doing it at this point. But I, I want to touch on something you said, which I think is, is very key, right? The vast majority of those 300,000 data sets are not as important as very few numbers of key data sets. And in a residential world, it's very easy to do an AVM, right? It may not work for the use case, right? But you have this, this broker ask, which is on one end of the spectrum. You have the replacement ask somewhere you know, at the other end of that spectrum assuming the broker's doing his job correctly. And in the middle, you have this kind of DCF and comps that will, will, will trade places. And it's a lot easier to do in a residential, especially a single family. It's very easy, but even in a multifamily, you can get the residential rates from around, from the MLSs, from different comp sources, which are fairly easy to source. It's just a matter of paying for it. And it improves on hyper-local models, but you can get there. You have the expenses, it's taxes, it's card, and right? you get these systems that you kind of plug into and you get the expense rolls. Especially if you're working with the partners directly, you can get access to their data directly. That, in a, in a commercial context, in an office space, is really, really, really hard to do without the lease data. And there's, at this point, one accurate source of that data, and it's sitting right here on our left. And maybe that's great in LA, in some of those big markets where you do really well, and when it comes down to probably Boise, Idaho, I'm just guessing it's probably not as great of a coverage and less data points to look at, and there are a lot more assumptions that need to be made. But what the good side on the commercial side is there's always a broker, well, I don't know if it's a good part of it, <laughs> there's always a broker on these, especially in the, you know, the top two million AAA, there's always a broker on these sides of transactions. And putting aside the you know, 50% of these onesies, you know, the local 7-Eleven or the restaurant buying the, the space that they're in, that big part that moves the market has some kind of agent involved that will take a look at those comps and do something to them. And that choice, the, the data, in, in my mind, means a lot. And collecting that data of what they, which comps they chose for what purpose that was actually successful at the end, I think is part of that storytelling. And that storytelling that agents do is, is data that we'd really like to capture and maybe ask the following question. All things equal, what can we do to sell this asset for a higher price? What, what things need to happen besides lying, right, which is always an easy thing to do, but what story can you tell around this asset with the data that's maybe different? And that's not my job to tell, but it's our job to enable that story. And maybe just one more anecdote. Um, to a point you made earlier. 
Zillow has this competition running for a long time to improve the Z estimate. I've, correct me if I'm wrong, they've never paid a dime to anyone for that competition. And I know that OfferPad, ha or um, not OfferPad, I can't remember the name of the company, they did um, a rent comp in New York, which did a thing with Two Sigma. Um, they also did some big competition. As far as I know, no one's ever paid out, which means that the, those improvements to that data science models have been really, really marginal, whereas we really haven't reached diminishing returns at good quality data going into those models. I, I would agree with that, but I think what's really fascinating is that I'm not sure industry is really, really ready to value that because no one knows to value that. There's sometimes there's latent value in actually having an understanding of having an incremental better fit to the model. And if they don't know how to exactly use it yet, then they're not going to pay for it either. But I think coming back to that, I think we're hitting on something that's really core to our, our problem every day, um, which is getting complete data. Now, my dream in my, in my life every day because of my wide data experiment in the, in the lab is to have for every single building every single lease contract and every single trade over time and being able to tell this complete story. How far are we away from my dream? I mean, not just for lease, but I mean, are we really far? I mean, I think when we first started asking these questions as, as, a, as an industry, we were, we, were, we were pretty far, but I feel like we've moved further. Yeah. Give, me, give me hope. <laughs> well, we were talking about this was yesterday, yesterday uh, even with the most complete data for today, right, you're still missing a lot of the historical data, which you yep. just may have not observed because it hasn't traded in a really long time. And yeah, time now you have to make some assumptions, which may or may not be correct, and they might improve over time, but they're not there. But um, it's, yeah, it's very difficult to make these decisions. I'm sure you make these heuristic decisions all day long, and you have the benefit of people on top of it, but the more folks like you are going to generate alpha, the more everyone else in the room is going to have to say, okay, wait a minute, how are they doing that? We better get all this data in place, right? Hopefully, there's a diffusion effect. There's a little bit of there's a there's this moment of understanding these alternative data sets as well as the complete data set. So for right. you, how close are we to? I don't, I don't think we're that far, honestly. I mean, um, but it's it's um, you know obviously I'm going to say that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean I, look, it very, it, for us it varies market by market, yeah. right? I mean, like we have almost every lease, we have probably every lease deal in New York City done in the last few years, and almost every deal done in the last five years, and vast majority over the last 10 years. But again, to your point, it's not everything over the last 10 years, but, but this year becomes last year, next year. So, <laughs> so it gets easier to get the historic data. And you know, I think um, the observations and the power of the crowd are meaningful. I, actually, I wanted to touch on, on your point about the, the value of the broker or the appraiser in, in, in them making those decisions and those judgments which is that it, it, it goes back to where we started a little bit in talking about machine learning and that you can, that's, those people are a source of supervised machine learning. You know, and you can actually look at the decisions made by individuals to inform the algorithms to, 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 that, to do that work and often to make that more efficient. In fact, we used a survey with our brokers and our, our 20,000 brokers, we surveyed them to find out which properties they thought were most similar to other properties yeah. and use that as supervised machine learning to train an algorithm that created competitive sets. And it works pretty well. Yeah, so in that sense, actually, the, the question of whether or not automation uh, for the built environment will start to take place, we, we're already starting to really play around with this. So your, your perspective of taking all of these different stakeholder perspectives, you said this earlier, you take various stakeholder perspectives, and then you try to sort of embody them, like repeat and watch what it is that they do in their decision-making process when they're forming prices, and, and then you try to mimic that in, a, in your algorithmic strategy. I think that's really fun. I mean, it's a fun academic exercise, <laughs> but I think it's also a really fun um, arbitrage, asset pricing ex exercise, because if we can start to find the routine and non-routine decision-making components, I mean, paid, I mean, we should all pay attention as an industry to that. This is huge. Yeah, and, and we're trying to do this not only with the value. I mean, we focused our discussion in the last few minutes about the value. Uh, which is maybe the m most basic thing, and there are models that are used for years, so it's easier to uh, to touch that. But uh, I think that if you take and you mentioned the in the income is something that is very important, the asset value. If you if you look at the income, and you try to predict, you look at an asset, and we still don't have the data that we all dream yeah. of, um, and um, 
and you're trying to predict what should be the current rent, again, for the arbitrage um, uh, opportunity in our case, or what will be or what can be the rent in the next few years, um, that's also something pretty big because, again, late, then it reflects the, the value uh, and how much you're willing to pay for an asset, even if the uh, appraiser came in and looked at the, at the comps and looked at the income and the cap rates and got to a different valuation. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, so I think this is another thing and, and there are different layers and I agree to what you said about the, uh, the values and, and trees, <laughs> uh, but we do find, and, and I'm not sure how much time it will take to have the data available. Uh, I, I believe it will happen faster than, than, we, than we think yeah. uh, because it happened, it happened in different industries and it's coming to real estate and actually when, when I've heard about um, uh, how Comstock is getting the data from brokers, I, will, I, was, I wasn't sure that people will, uh, like will actually trade their own data because everyone treats the data today as gold. And you want to, if you have the data, you want to keep it to yourself. But this is, I mean, this is changing. This is happening uh, in other industries, and it's, I think it's starting to happen in, in real estate as well. That's fantastic. Are we going to get to my dream, LD? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if your dream is as utopian as you think, though. Um, think <laughs> about public markets, right? Uh, has anyone called a stockbroker in the last year and asked their opinion on a stock and bought one? I hope no one's going to raise their hand. Um, there's a reason you're not raising your hand because the thought of that broker having any special th thought process that might be valuable is unfathomable, right? Yet you call your real estate broker every day and ask their opinion. And that's not going to change overnight, but it will change over the next 20, 30 years, right? And that job of that, that broker is going to be to be an interpreter of the data and a trusted advisor a lot more than their job is to hold on to this private data that only they have access to. And as that process happens, we're going to see I don't know if this is good or bad, we'll probably see another 50 skylines, right? We'll see big funds that always were regular big funds. They'll all of a sudden call themselves AI funds. They'll maybe for marketing for their LPs in the beginning, but hopefully also as a, as a real strategy because we know that there are a lot of really great things sitting in, in the brain trust and some of real estate investors because they're doing their job really well, but it's never been codified, right? And some of those things they do are mistakes, and we're going to have to take out the things they do wrong and cut those deals out of the process and add deals that they might have not looked at because they missed something because you just can't possibly process all that data. And more and more models around time to sell, churn rate, um, you know, cap rates, and all you know, rent potential, all these different models that will, will support that decision will help it so you, you actually generate alpha. And when those that are generating alpha look to the right and left, um, they're going to see folks either disappearing or joining or, or converting. So I think that that self-cycle is going to drive people to kind of create that vision of yours, at least to that point. But it might put a lot of people in, in a tough spot to change, right? I agree with that. that I mean, that's, that's very, very hard. I'm curious if the, if the audience has any sort of thoughts or, or questions for these three lovely gentlemen. Because when it comes to the, the, the notion of automation of one of our most valued or most treasured occupations within real estate, um, I think that's a very, very touchy subject. I mean, we certainly treat it as a very, very significant data, data ethics issue here at MIT, where we talk about, okay, if we're automating or codifying specific tasks, um, what does that mean for our industry in the short run and in the long run? And, and what does it mean that we're actually talking about? But I think, I think I'd be interested to also hear whether or not the audience has any questions about that. I see. Well, it's not McDonald's workers, right? So let's just make the well, differentiation. No, right? no there's, there's a cycle. There's, there's, of course, there's, there's non routine, there's cognitive routine and cognitive non routine tasks in all of yeah. our jobs. I mean, I'm, I'm automating aspects of my job every day, but. I think thinking about what does that mean for us overall um, and having that open conversation much better than manufacturing did, much better than other production industries did, I think it would be honorable, be something that's worthwhile doing. I see, in the, I see back here we have a great question. Yep. So why is it one or the other? Why is it a binary decision? Like, I don't think it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the question from the audience is why is it one or the other? Does it have to be either or, or can we have both? I, I think that's a great point. Um, and it's not binary. It's not one or the other. It's, uh, the technology is here to support, the, to support your work. 
Um, I think there are a lot of researchers in different fields that is showing that the, co the combination between humans and machine are powerful. Uh, there's one with uh, breast cancer that compared between doctors and the machine. The doctors were, I don't remember the exact numbers, but with an, around 95% accuracy for the doctors and then 92.5% for the machine. At the beginning, a great success for human, but then they saw it, um, the, the mistakes are different and by combining both of them together, they reached to 99.5%. And this is, uh, I think all of us, uh, this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. How we're trying to support the people that eventually take the decision. And I think it's also important to understand how you use the technology and what you what are, I mean, setting expectations between the, the customer, uh, the user of the system and the technology. And we talked about the valuation models and we talked about the different views. Um, when we try to, just a, one example to that, when we try to, uh, to set our own goals of how accurate we're trying to be when it comes to valuation. Yeah. So we try to look at comparables. So we looked at uh, Zestimate that has all the data and are doing single family, uh, single uh, home, sorry, uh, which is probably easier uh, to get more accurate. We looked at their errors and then, which is about 5% made. This is the way we measure the, uh, the accuracy. And then we looked at, uh, we took uh, appraisals from uh, the last 10 years. And I don't remember the number of appraisals that we had in hand, but in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, we, saw, we took the, uh, the appraisals and then the actual value that the asset was transacted, if it was transacted within three months. And the error was about 10%. So, and this was done by humans that sit a lot of hours and using traditional models. So when you look at the, uh, at the technology, what do you want to te the technology to achieve? Above the 10%, below the 10%? So setting the goals and, how, and define how you want to work together with the technology is very important. Well, uh, work together with technology, <coughs> I think, is key, and especially in the next decade. Yeah, and the scale is important too, right? Because those error rates are kind of BS, you know, because yeah, maybe it's 5% for the Zillow's estimate, but in some cases it's off by 30%, and in some cases it's off by 1%. On average, it's off by 5%, but the problem is that most people dealing in commercial real estate are looking at individual assets. Yeah. And you know, the 5% is great if you're looking at a portfolio of hundreds or thousands of assets. The, the banks that are using these AVMs are putting their entire single family home portfolio through it. It's fine if they're off entirely on some of those assets. Um, I think that to your point, LD, before about like the, you know, are you calling your broker? Well, no, you're not calling your broker to trade on the public markets, which are driven by these index funds that are driving the market movements. But you are calling your investment banker to buy a, but to buy a, a, com a private company, yeah. or you are working with a, you know, venture capital firm or a private equity firm to invest in private companies. Um, so I think that as this industry, you know, one one shift that's going to happen in this industry is going to be you know, the transparency around the trading of these assets and the, you know, more ability to come in and out of assets and more liquidity to buy, to, to trade in real estate the way people trade in stocks, yeah. which will enable a lot of this more at scale and, and sooner. But we talk about it in, in class uh, all the time. We're actually asking a private market to take on public market features more and more and more and more. And we're digging into it much more than we ever thought we would. Um, and that's changing to some degree the fundamentals. It will have a secondary feedback loop to it um, from an asset pricing perspective. But I think to, to your point, as we go through this process over the next, we've been going through it for the past three to five years, but now as we really go through this process of pushing real estate from being a private asset to taking on the features of being a public asset, and I don't, not everybody's necessarily comfortable with that, but we're all engaging in a strategy that looks like that. Uh, I agree. And to your point, you're right. These things trade a lot slower, so we're not going to see that liquidity yeah. in and out. It's a lot harder to get in and out of these, some of these LLCs. With all due respect to the blockchain community trying to create this kind of liquid market, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Not because of technology, but it's business challenges. Um, but I will say this, our fastest growing client category are the largest hedge funds in the world. And they're all looking at real estate now and spending a lot of time and money here building models for specific real estate data. And these are the biggest hedge funds in the world. And to be fair, we did this with our last company that we sold to Oppenheimer, right? We did the exact same thing for late stage private equity. Everyone said, well, 
why is private equity going to work? It's the same challenge with real estate. And we said, okay, let's limit the problem to those 18 months before the IPO where we predict some kind of liquidity. I, I see these exact same things happening in, in, in the public market. So they're tracking REITs and CMBS and RMBS back to the actual asset level and be able to track that programmatically. Um, they're now doing that with a lot of private equity funds. So they hold LP positions in some of the biggest funds in the world, like the Blackstones and Brookfields. And then when you look at what they're doing, they're trying to figure out which one of these private equity funds should I be betting on that will actually be on that top quartile next year. So maybe it doesn't get down to the actual, you know, maybe at home and garden where you have the massive kind of level of aggregation. It probably won't be at the ass level. I think that's what folks like you will do a really good job at hopefully in the future and it'll be really cool. But it's still, ha yeah, I mean, it's still <laughs> happening at the high level. And the fact that hedge funds are here tells you something. I want to I want to turn ask one more question for, or two more questions from the audience. We have two big hands. So you were you were patient. Yes, yes. Uh, this has a threshold uh, to incorporate uh, amenities, retail, and around it, right? But how do you go about incorporating data such as infrastructure improvements or impediments uh, within the given area, macro uh, level uh, factors or micro level factors within valuations? Let me make sure that the audience can hear this. So we're looking for understanding how infrastructure scale investments um, at the macro scale and micro level data like rents and transaction prices can pair together to come up with a more accurate uh, financial prediction. Yeah. yeah, OK. So I think I mentioned we have more than 200 different data sources. Some of them are, we have stock market data and public data. We have, we're looking at roads and, and um, macro data. Um, and eventually the way the data acquisition process works for us um, is that we have different hypotheses or different predictive models we're trying to, uh, or we have different predictive models and then we have different hypotheses of what kind of data can impact this predictive model. And what we do is we're trying to uh, find this kind of data sources, then we add them to the mix and see how it impacts the accuracy levels of our predictive models. And based on that, we decide what data we want to acquire. Um, so we see some things that are, a few things that are impacting the, uh, the overall prediction uh, or the, the specific predictions and based on that we decide what data to buy or not. I this hope that helps. It's more general than... But I, I think taking doing a this... terrible job, by the way. Just my, we just did some work with New York City trying to figure out the flood maps and how that affects property. It's completely not taken into consideration at any of the corporate level. It just seems like one of these far scenarios that are so far beyond my decision scope that it's hard to think in. We kind of go back to what, what affects the actual model today. Even though they spent $207 trillion last year just on flood-related. It's worse. It, it, that, yeah. Talk yeah. about the L subway. Which, $207 billion, sorry. It, not it can get really bad in New York. That would have been more than the global GDP. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yes, you start with the highest price someone hears, they don't shock, you say per month, they still don't shock, you say per seat, then you go, oh, and you work your way back. <laughs> You've answered that before, LD. Okay. <laughs> I didn't hear the question, I'm trying to understand the question based on your answer. How do you think about pricing at early stages? Plus hey. one to LD. <laughs> uh, we have one more question in the back. Comp stack. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, I'm going to, I mean, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Crowdsourcing is valuable where there's not public record data. I mean, that's, that's where it's most valuable. Um, but I think, you know, one thing you have to be very conscious of is, is there a culture of sharing information? So we were able to make this work because people were all, already sharing data in the industry. If you try to take, you know, our model and bring it into a country where people are very close to the vest and they don't share this information and, you know, it'll be a lot harder to, to make it successful. So... You know, it's not, it doesn't go, it's not just the, 
it's not like the least transparent, the less transparency there is, the better crowdsourcing works. It doesn't exactly work that way. Fantastic. Gentlemen, I have learned a great deal from the three of you in the past hour. I, I think, do you have anything last parting, big dream wishes that you want to offer to the data universe before we leave? Anything you want? <laughs> Anything you want, LD? Sure. More, more? Do you have? Do you have a four hundred thousand data source goal? No. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say this though. I mean, we, we say this a lot. You know, find what you're actually good at, right? And, and spend that. Our unofficial motto as a company is, "On top of the mountain, you're all snow leopards," which is a Hunter Thompson quote, right? If you can do one thing in the world better than anyone else, you're a natural friend of mine. If your expertise is cleaning data, building decision models, collecting comp data, do that. If it's not, Focus on what you do really well and adopt whatever technology around you will make you do your job much better and you'll instinctively feel how much value it adds. And if it doesn't feel that way, probably shouldn't be working with that company. Technology is a tool. Yeah, I would say don't be afraid of, uh, utilize, or, you know, of adopting new technologies, but be sure you, you set the goals and the KPIs for doing that and that you use it as a tool and, and not as a goal. That's fantastic. Yeah, what those guys said. <laughs> oh, come on. What, what, is, what is your parting oh, dream? That's a cop out, Michael. What's your parting dream, Michael? My, my parting dream is that, is that everyone thinks about making, uh, thinking of, thinks of data as table stakes. That everyone works under the assumption that they have to have every data at their fingertips. Because once everybody has access to all the same data, then it gets really interesting because it causes everybody to be really creative. To have to think beyond just what you can what you could arbitrage with the data, but actually how you can think outside the box. I love that, and then we can creatively solve some of these big, big problems that we have: the floodplain problem, <laughs> the climate change problem, the automation robotics problem. Yeah, fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank, panel. You. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Thanks.